my job since I was back there at the birth of environmental sociology is to talk about that and give you some sense of its evolution. So historical background. We have des uh, described this field as the study of relationships between modern industrial societies, the study of societal environmental interactions, <coughs> but more broadly, and perhaps accurately, it's described as a sociological investigation of environmental issues. That would be a really encompassing. And I'm going to argue, and I've been arguing it for many decades, that uh, it, we were, uh, our field was born in a disciplinary context that was not very receptive to sociological analysis of biophysical data, our phenomena, and I'll try to show you why. But in the <clears throat> early to mid 70s, and really it started late 60s with growing societal interest in environmental issues, but then peaking with that first Earth Day. And by the way, my, my first engagement, as I mentioned, was a study of Earth Day activists way back in 1970. This stimulated growing sociological interest. The, the, when we've already seen some examples of this, when phenomena becomes major social phenomena, that society at large pays attention to them, it draws the attention of sociologists. But the bulk of this early work focused on things like environmentalism, study of the environmental movement, environmental activists, et cetera, um, public concern for the environment, attitudes and all that, I'll talk about a lot more tomorrow, governmental actions, et cetera. And when I thought about it, all of those kinds of studies simply drew upon well-established fields, subfields of sociology study of social movements, study of political sociology, social psychology. So when I heard this word environmental sociology, it's like, that's so cool, I want to be one. But it was like, but what is it? You know, how could you put, I went out, when I left grad school, I actually put, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed, but this was 71 when I put the Vita together, 70, man environment relations on my Vita, because that was a well-established term. But I wanted to be an environmental sociologist, but we had to figure out what this was. So in the, I thought you raised your hand already. <laughs> okay. You've heard the term social constructivism. And basically, we could think of all this work as analyzing how environment or environmental quality became socially constructed, takes activists, takes media attention, takes policy actors to finally get an issue at the top of the public agenda. Okay? So again, this was pretty traditional work. This was traditional stuff for sociologists, but with a new topic. So <clears throat> a colleague and I called this the sociology of environmental issues. But the 73-74 energy crisis, which had a profound effect on me because I got stuck at a Portland gas station coming back from the Bay Area to Pullman, Washington for almost four hours. Had a profound effect. Um, that, along with growing uh, awareness, acid rain, really serious problems, showed that society could be fundamentally affected by environmental conditions and in turn was certainly affecting the environment. And this led to the phrase societal environmental interactions. Now there was only a modest amount of work along these lines. And Schneeber wrote an influential article that affected me a lot in 75. Um, this kind of work, though, made it apparent that you could discern a little bit of sociological analysis of these societal environmental interactions. And that said, aha, there is such a thing as core environmental sociology. Now, there's always been some work on solutions. In the early days, very micro level, talk about this. Nowadays, it tends to be more macro with ecological modernization that Dana will talk about. And so it's sort of grown important. So I'm going to talk a lot about causes and impacts. And off, since I'm supposed to give this history, some organizational developments. These intellectual interests, this kind of brewing interest, led first in 1973 to an environmental problems division being established in the Society of, for the Study of Social Problems. I arrived at Washington State University, went to a senior colleague, and I said, there's a small group of us doing this. Do you think triple SP? And he said, right, right to my friend, the president, and I did. And next thing I knew, 
and it's not wise as a new assistant professor mm -hmm. to try to establish an organization. But anyway, within a, a year, I was chairing this new division. But it was quickly overtaken in 1976 by a section on environmental sociology within the American Sociological Association. These two joined a natural resources group that had been formed in the Rural Sociological Society back in the mid-60s. Um, the NRRG, as we call it, has a somewhat narrower focus and there was a, a good deal of interaction in the early days between us, but also some sort of turf protection and so forth. So, it, so let's get to the disciplinary context part. So Catton and I use this phrase again, uh, the study of societal environmental interactions to define the field. But we also looked around and we looked at environmental studies in particular, but some other fields and said, you know, sociology, we're talking now, we started doing this in 1976. Sociology is really lagging behind, and why is that? And we argued that there were two interrelated factors. And now, the, this morning and earlier has been a good background for this. You've seen that sociology was born in the industrial era, the great transition. But it was born well into the industrial era when progress and growth seemed to be the natural state of affairs. We, and uh, we were increasingly being able to control nature. Humans could master nature. And it, this whole mentality became a core belief in what philosophers, some historians called the dominant Western worldview. Kind of a simplify a whole lot of work. But it's a core belief that we're now able to control. Now, we're in the 1970s, remember. I know some of you weren't here. But. But second, traditions unique to sociology, especially pioneer Emil Durkheim's anti-reductionism dictum. I'll talk about that shortly. So this sort of re reinforced within sociology, this ignoring the biophysical environment. So we have external forces and internal forces. So we argued as a result that sociology, like society at large, had come to view modern societies, what we call exempt from, an e from ecological constraints. And we decided to label this the human exemptionalist paradigm. But it was a paradigm, sort of a disciplinary view, and I would say though shared with most social sciences, that was a sort of a scholarly manifestation of the dominant Western worldview. And then stimulated by Rachel Carson, Barry Commoner, commoners' laws of ecology, I had that on my wall and so forth, and Ehrlich, we discerned an ecological view arising, certainly in intellectual circles, in academia, but with environmentalism, it was also pushing the sort of major change, and there were all kinds of things by the late 70s. We got to replace the industrial worldview with an ecological worldview. Uh, the frontier, what was it? Uh, the the frontier worldview with the spaceship Earth, Kenneth Boulding, uh, people making these kinds of arguments. So we said, you know, what seems to be going on is that people are arguing that we have to replace this exemptionless view with a more ecologically oriented view. So we had HEP, and what do you do? You come up with NEP, you know? So I think I, on my gravestone, though, I HEP NEP, you know? But anyway, so let's quickly compare. now. We said that um, these, our first article was very short. In the second one, where we had more room, we discerned four categories that helped us make sense of this. Assumptions about the nature of human beings, assumptions about social causation, the context of human society, and constraints. In the interest of time, let me just talk about two. Social causation. The dominant Western world, you know, you know, people are masters of the destiny. We can choose our goals, we can learn to, you know, do whatever is necessary. The sociological version, social and cultural factors, including technology, are the major determinants of human affairs. And we argued that instead, we need to recognize that human affairs are influenced, not just by these social cultural factors, but you can read the rest, but, and the key part here is, Purposive human actions have many unintended consequences. Lo and behold, nuclear power didn't turn out to be the world's solution 
that was originally posed. How about the context of human society? The world is vast and thus unlimited opportunities for humans. Wow. The sociological version, social and cultural environments are the crucial context for human affairs, and thus the biophysical environment is largely irrelevant. The ecological paradigm, had to be careful here, Catton wanted nature bat, bats last or something. Humans live in and are dependent upon this finite biophysical environment, which imposes these constraints. I tried to capture the thrust of this. How many of you know Julian Simon? He was, by the way, at Maryland. He's the godfather of Bjorn Lomborg and everyone, and he wrote a book called The Ultimate Resource. No one can say this if you know, but what's the, what do you think his ultimate resource was? Water? Human beings, the human mind, and therefore the logical outcome was the more people we have, the more Einsteins, Mozarts, the better off we will be. And by the way, the US population policy shifted under Reagan, at the Mexico world population, whatever it's called, because of the influence of Julian Simon. He got engaged in this vicious ongoing debate with Paul Ehrlich in several places, but I got to comment on one. And here I really, I think I distilled the two paradigms. If you're an exemptionist, you see uh, the world is infinite and humans are essentially omnipotent. But if you're more of an ecologically oriented person, you tend to see the world is rather finite and humans is constrained by that finiteness, okay? That leads to my only diagram. So, Julian Simon would see a whole bunch of, you know, like breeding rabbits. Everyone, you know, see the eyes and the ears or maybe antelopes. And they're just having more and more babies and just, you know, the world and, you know, antelope minds are very, you know, very good. Paul Ehrlich, however, sees a nest full of hungry birds with their beaks open waiting for mommy to come home and so forth. They looked at the same things and came to totally different conclusions. And really, Lomborg, who more of you have heard of, I trust, you know, cites Julian Simon as his inspiration. Now, here's the issue. Paradigms are not theories. And our original very short article was ambiguous and it led some including my good buddy late buddy Fred Buttle to sort of interpret us as saying throw out sociological theories and replace it with ecology and we really weren't trained to say that uh, and we tried to clear that up but once that critique is made it sort of stayed with us but paradigms are these fundamental assumptions they underlie more specific theories you know like Kuhn's kind of the lenses through which we see the world conflict theorists uh, consensus theorists in the old days, so forth. So it's therefore possible to develop ecologically sound, non-exemptionist in my term, theories based on Marxism, Weberian, well, Marxist, uh, Weberian, Durkheimian, other theoretical perspectives. And in fact, over time, there has been this gradual greening. So John Bellamy Foster is greening Marxism. And there's a, a lot of other work going on along those lines. And nowadays, I'm pleased to say that climate change, at least, has stimulated calls for post-exemptionalist theorizing. I like that term very much. It's not, it's not so widely used yet. Now let's shift back to the discipline, the Durkheimian legacy. So besides shedding the blinders of the HGP, environmental sociologists had to overcome this tradition of avoiding the biophysical environment. So what Durkheim did, and many of us would think, you know, Comte was, yeah, he was a first, but Durkheim was big daddy <laughs> or something. All right. And um, what you do in order to justify a new discipline is say it has a unique subject matter. And for him, it was these social facts. And specifically said, we must explain social facts only by other social facts. So you explain suicide, not by depression, they didn't have that term in those days, but by individual psychology or by weather climate, you explain it by social integration and so forth. Um, sociologists were taught to avoid biological, geographical, physical factors. And I like to go like this. Let's start differentiation of variables that influence human behavior. The first is human nature. Somewhere way back there, like, why did this man become so bad? 
Uh, you know, it's just human nature. There's always a few rotten apples. I, I don't know the philosopher who said that. So. Uh, but then we learn to distinguish environment and heredity. Why is this person so bad? Look at his father. What would you expect? You know, it's, or poor kid, look how he, look at the environment. You know, his dad's in jail and his mother's a drug addict. Something like that. And then, after this distinction was made, we finally got a distinction between biophysical environments and sociocultural. And it's this, the top one, that became the unique domain of sociology. As each of these distinctions was made, sociologists, and I would argue virtually all other social scientists, opted for the top one. We, kept, we wanted to avoid biological determinism, and environmental determinants. This was understandable. Who wants to explain racial differences by, you know, some genetic factors or nowadays uh, gender differences by the weakness of women? So it's, it's very bad stuff. Okay, but more importantly, it's good sociology to to look at these social factors. So I argue, though, these were understandable, important, and just like to. To set up biochemistry, you had to say that there's something unique here that uh, requires setting up a new field. Okay? But the ecological baby was thrown out with the bathwater. So I love this. I stumbled across this article, 1968, in ASR, America. And you can see it. The main accomplishment and direction of the social sciences to date is a progressive substitution of sociocultural explanations for those stressing the determinative influence. So sociologists got away from all kinds of other determinism and became sociocultural determinists. Now, in reality, Durkheim himself and lots of other sociologists violated his dictum. They brought in environmental conditions, but they were typically not the major foci. Um, along the way, rural sociologists who focused on agriculture, forestry, mining, and so forth, certainly took these factors into account, but their work was somewhat marginal, I would say, to the larger discipline. But we were writing in the 70s, and we're arguing by the 70s, technological advances, growing affluence, created the sense that progress and prosperity were guaranteed. Modern societies had escaped ecological constraints. Let me show you four huge figures in sociology in 1970 and read their reactions to toxins. In the first case, just about uh, the importance of pollution. In the other three cases, though, the talk about limits. These are typically responses to the Limits to Growth book. I mean, these are major, major figures. And I think this captures the intellectual tone of the discipline when we were writing in the 70s. Uh, Fred went on to criticize this for ignoring all the classical theorists. Well, but we weren't focusing on the classical theorists. We were focusing on what was going on in sociology in the 70s. I argue in a much later article the global environmental change became the dagger in the heart of exemptionalism. I mean, when you see that humans are in fact having this profound impact on the biophysical environment at a global scale and so forth, uh, and in turn recognize the profound impacts that it can have on humans, I would say to me that was sort of a, an ecological paradigm gone mainstream. It was, I can't tell you this book, it was just an overview, was a real pathbreaker because even physics and other fields, they weren't talking about global environmental change for them. Uh, like I've used that last quote many times. So the growing awareness of the uh, GEC, the consequent credibility of this paradigm has really helped, I say, um, nowadays, especially with climate change, has helped uh, provide legitimacy to environmental sociology. It's encouraged sociologists to focus attention on environmental problems, not worry about that. When Andrew writes an article and he has all these measures, he's gonna say, oh, by the way, I'm violating Durkheim. I mean, you just do your stuff, you know? It's so <laughs> obvious now. But it wasn't that way in the 70s. In the 1980s, analyses of societal environmental interactions were becoming more common. They typically involve looking at the social impacts or societal on environment 
rather than vice versa. But I would argue that the impacts of toxic waste and other hazards on local communities helped reverse that. Starting with Love Canal in the 79, 79 and now it's just become a huge area overlapping with um, EJ. The 1990s saw this explosion of cross-national studies, the kinds of things that Tom and Andrew do. Again, though, I would say in the early days, it's perhaps a legacy of anti-environmental determinism, uh, Durkheim dictum. There was, again, still more of a tendency, let's explain greenhouse gas emissions or footprints with societal factors. Now, let's not look at how yet climate change is going to affect humans. But over the last decade or so, climate change has really stimulated people to say, okay, what, what are the effects of this going to be? A really fundamentally important article published by Richard Jork and colleagues in 2003 trying to explain variation and national level footprints, published in ASR. It used latitude as a proxy for climate as a predictor variable. More of a control, but that predict. Not surprisingly, they found latitude had a big effect or significant effect. If you're in Finland, you got to use more heat than if you're in Italy. But no one raised any questions about, oh my God, it's environmental determinism, et cetera. And again, at this point in time, we just do our stuff and don't, don't worry so much. However, I have to point out, a few sociologists, Nico Sturr and Journey, they still issue warnings of climate determinism. All you folks, sociologists emphasizing climate change, be careful. And uh, this, I, grant, I still sense a continuing hesitance to grant causative powers. So for example, famous study of the heat wave in Chicago, but other studies. Excellent sociology, but what they do is show or emphasize how mortality from heat waves is inequitably distributed by race and class, but they pretty much imply that it's poverty and isolation that kill people, not the heat. I'm like, no, dude, you got it wrong. The heat's killing people. It's just killing people who are poor and minority. Okay? So anyway, we've made a lot of progress, though. In general, environmental sociology and the larger discipline make great strides in overcoming both human exemptionism and uh, dis disciplinary perspectives. It's rare to see expressions of exemptionism in mainstream sociology. Um, most people don't, to my dismay, don't feel a need to discuss HEPNAP. They just do their environmental sociology. But there are a number of studies, like the Longo et al. book. We're seeing things that make me feel good. The one on the oceans. And they say, you know, what we're trying to do is flesh out Catton and Dunlap's paradigm argument to provide an ecological perspective. And I'm happy to see that kind of work. However, while sociology has made great progress, Boy, has there been a resurgence of exemptionalism in society at large. Uh, I would say one of our two political parties is essentially running on a human exemptionalist platform. We're going to make America great again. We could, climate change is a non-issue, et cetera. And how many of you have heard of the Breakthrough Institute? Yeah. Or uh, Sh Schellenberger and Nordhaus, the death of environmentalism. They're, well, now they're under this thing. Now, most of us, we hear the word Anthropocene and we're going like, man, this is scary because we've, you know, human impact is so, they're like, not to worry. Humans are in control now. It's going to be a good Anthropocene. <laughs> we're going to pilot this spaceship Earth to new heights. We're going to accomplish things that you guys, you know. And so exemptionalism is definitely alive and well in the larger society, even though it has little presence, I think, in academic circles. So finally, well, almost finally, I would say at this point, environmental sociology is thriving. 40 years, it's been a long time. Um, the ASA section is sometimes breaks 500 members. As you saw there, we are kind of in the middle. Not one of the largest, but definitely not one of the smallest. Um, in the early 90s, the International Sociological Association established a research committee. It's called Environment Society. It's quickly become one of the largest and most active in the International Sociological Association. Many nations have national organizations, and the Japanese have this huge one. It's over 600 members. 
has a lot of non-sociologists actually, and they publish their own journal. And Germany, the UK, uh, there are little environmental social groups all around. What's perhaps more pragmatically important, within the USA, more and more departments are adding environmental sociology classes, we think due to student interest. Uh, several PhD specializations now exist. And of course, the outcome, if you're a young scholar, Man, th this year there have been more ads for environmental sociologists in history. It's just mind-boggling. I mean, I, I open these things, and I'm like, yes, yes. Makes, I wish I could start all over and was on the job market <laughs> this year. And rather than getting the end of my career, I'd like to be going. Now, a really important thing, though, to end on is that we've heard the talk about interdisciplinarity. I want to point out that what's gone on in environmental sociology has these complementary interdisciplinary trends. So chance, what is chance? You all know it, but look at the, quote, the second quote. Explicitly addresses complex interactions and feedback between the human and natural systems. They kind of ignored environmental sociology, <laughs> like we were there first. But anyway, um, we're doing the same thing. And not surprisingly, a lot of environmental sociologists, including myself nowadays, work on projects kind of framed as chance studies. and. Um, that's one mechanism, but the other thing we hear is sustainability science. A really important article by Cates et al. And what do they say? A new field of sustainability science is emerging that seeks to understand the fundamental character of interaction between nature and society. All these folks like to create new stuff, you know, like, so like you kind of ignore other things, but disciplinary silos is understandable. So anyway, this leads to my last slide except for references, it's therefore not surprising that environmental sociologists on average have strong interdisciplinary orientations and often work on multidisciplinary projects. And the latest review in the annual review of sociology, I've got my bibliography, you can, you can see it. They simply describe it as a growing interdisciplinary area of study. I will add something, there still is a difference though. You get some people those of us who are core environmental sociologists, we just sort of move along like that. You get other people who come in, including some of the world's polity folks or the World Civil Society, David John Frank, they'll come in and they'll do some very nice, good work on environment, but then they'll take that perspective and focus on education. They'll focus on all kinds of dependent variables. So um, it adds important things, you know, and uh, the field moves on. So, Okay, well, I give you a bunch of our old stuff, and I, I actually like this chapter where I got to ref I was trying to get the last word in, you know. <laughs> my gut, Fred Buttle and I were very good friends, and we just had a lifelong series of debates, but we didn't comment on, we learned not to write comments on one another. We would just criticize what the other had done in our own paper, and then back and forth and so forth. But hey, I loved the guy. It's very sad he died so young. Um, and speaking of that, here's some really early things, including a, a nice piece from Fred Buttle. And this, the first time I saw the term environmental sociology was in Klausner's book. So you can see when I call my, you know, identifying my area as man-environment relations, it's not like I was <coughs> unique for the era because only men were in their environment and only men had urban experiences, et cetera. But here's the classic piece by Schneeberg that doesn't get nearly as much attention as the treadmill, but I really, really liked it a lot. And then here's just the series of annual review of social articles that kind of mirror key trends. And um, you see Tom shows up there and so forth. And then I have to, the one I put on the reading list that I stuck in there too. So, okay, thank you very much.